So I need to um, give Mary some credit. It wasn't this morning that she asked me to do a keynote address. It was actually yesterday morning. So I've had a few hours. <laughs> but actually, um, Mary, thank you for that very warm and beautiful introduction and for inviting me to speak this morning. And we are all so very lucky to have such an incredible WPS champion in you. And um, thank you for this wonderful conference and for all that you do year round on WPS. I also want to thank the Naval War College Foundation, Admiral Howe, and my fellow participants. This has been a fantastic conference as always. Uh, as Mary mentioned, my name is Sarah Capel and I am the policy lead for Women, Peace, and Security in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. And as Mary mentioned, in this capacity, I'm directly responsible for the department's implementation of the National Action Plan. But before we dive into what the Department of Defense is doing with respect to implementing the NAP, let me take us back a little bit and provide some statistics. We know that half of all peace agreements fail within the first five years. However, an agreement is 35% more likely to succeed at least 15 years if women participate in its creation. When included as meaningful participants in the negotiation of peace agreements, women enlarge the scope of those agreements to include the broader set of critical societal priorities and needs required for lasting peace. For example, women played a key role in the negotiations that led to the 1996 Guatemalan Peace Accords and ultimately helped shape a deal with significant human rights orientations, including gender sensitive provisions. And women in conflict states confide in female peacekeepers and are understood better by them. And when at least 30% of peacekeepers are female, local women become more involved in the peace process. I would like to spend my time taking you through where the Department of Defense is with respect to implementation of the National Action Plan on Women, Peace and Security, which I will refer to as the NAP. I might also have, being from DOD, I have a tendency to throw out acronyms uh, more often than not. And if I uh, use an acronym that you're unfamiliar with, just flag or ask during questions, and I will explain it, apologize in advance. So, DOD implement, implements our leadership's objectives through policy frameworks, strategic guidance, and planning documents. We have looked for ways to infuse Women, Peace, and Security, or WPS, into these documents because building WPS into them is critical to integrating this initiative into the department's daily business. Following the release of the NAP, the Secretary of Defense issued a memorandum directing implementation of the NAP and recognizing that the goal of the NAP is critical to our national security. We have developed an implementation guide for the NAP that serves as a tool for applying the NAP objectives into the strategic, operational, and tactical environments by providing examples of DOD programs and activities that support the NAP's five high-level objectives and associated outcomes. And in October 2013, the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy released a memorandum formalizing and promulgating this guide for DOD-wide use. Five of our six geographic combatant commands, our geographic command centers, have incorporated WPS principles into their theater campaign plans. These are the planning documents that guide their day-to-day -day operations. And incredibly, the fifth geographic command, geographic combatant command, has included WPS language in their draft theater campaign plan and is just awaiting its signature and release. That's an incredible statistic for DOD. So how do combatant commands integrate WPS into these planning documents, these theater campaign plans? Well, US Southern Command has incorporated key tasks specifically addressing women's integration in partner nation militaries and ministries of defense, as well as protecting the needs of women in conflict areas. DOD has five regional centers 
institutions where military and civilian participants from nations across the globe engage in research, communication, and the exchange of ideas regarding security issues related to a specific geographic region. The regional centers have also taken steps to incorporate WPS goals and objectives throughout their work by specifically providing for WPS within their guiding documents. This is the building WPS into our DNA. For the first time in April 2014, for example, one of our regional centers, the Asia Pacific Center for Strategic Studies, or APCSS, released a strategy document on WPS. Objectives in the strategy document include ensuring WPS elements are incorporated into course curriculum, providing and maintaining a WPS community of interest, and achieving a goal of 25% female participation in all resident courses. And APCSS is not the only regional center to establish a goal for female participation. Four out of our five regional centers have established such a goal. The department's leadership has underscored their commitment to WPS and implementation of the NAP. In this slide, you'll see just some examples of the senior leaders that are uh, really helping push WPS forward uh, in the department. And I um, have to note that I'm Sir, I've searched the internet to find a picture uh, last night of Ambassador McGann actually implementing and not a, uh, a headshot. He should be on here as well. Um, but this is just a sampling and uh, certainly one of our, our senior uh, leader champions. Um, in 2015, so senior, senior leadership is critically important. And in 2015, we saw the publication of Women on the Front Lines of Peace and Security, as Ambassador McGahn mentioned yesterday, with the foreword authored jointly by former secretaries Clinton and Panetta, and essays from high-ranking military officials. And in March, we saw the publication of National Defense University's Center for Complex Operations Security Journal, PRISM, dedicated entirely to women, peace, and security. If you do not have a copy of either of these publications, please feel free to contact me, and I will provide you with the web address, as they are both available online, going green, and to work to get you hard copies, if so desired. On March 8th, 2016, International Women's Day, the Secretary of Defense released a message where he recognized DOD's efforts to empower women around the globe through implementation of the NAP. A huge step. And also in March, U.S. Southcom's commander issued a letter to all staff at the command recognizing U.S. Southcom's commitment to implementing the NAP, including work to incorporate gender perspectives into partner nation peace and security policies, and improve gender integration in partner nation armed forces. The letter reads in part, at US Southern Command, we are taking concrete actions to advance the national security strategy, which emphasizes that countries are more peaceful and prosperous when women are accorded full and equal rights, when women have access to education, health services, and political rights, we see a positive effect on families, communities, and the whole of society. These advancements are building blocks for economic growth, peace, and stability. A number of DOD components have developed specialized training on WPS that aims to improve overall mission effectiveness by ensuring that individuals have a functional knowledge of gender and human rights issues. For example, U.S. Africa Command has a WPS briefing that they've incorporated into their newcomers orientation course that is provided to all new staff 06 and below that come through the command, also the SCOs and DATs as well. The briefing aims to provide staff with an awareness of why WPS topics are important through an overview of UN Security Council Resolution 1325 and the NAP how WPS issues are addressed in the command's plans, exercises, operations, and engagements, and how each person at the command 
can incorporate WPS into their products. As part of DOD's implementation of the NAP, many of our components have established WPS leads or focal points to enha enhance WPS coordination, implementation, and accountability within specific, specific sectors and contexts. These are our equivalent of gender advisors. For example, all regional centers and combatant com geographic combatant commands have a WPS lead or focal point. And in 2014, US Pacific Command assigned a WPS program manager in the strategy and policy branch and directed each component, direct reporting unit, and sub-unified command to select a WPS point of contact to implement the NAP. Activities undertaken in support of NAP objectives in turn generate ongoing benefits because the department evaluates and learns from its past work in order to inform our future programs and activities. DOD has a monthly synchronization group, WPS synchronization group, which I co-chair with my wonderful colleague, Commander Elaine Collins. And this working group, the purpose of it is to share lessons learned and best practices among the combatant commands, military, military departments, regional centers, and some of the professional military education institutions. And also thanks to Commander Collins, we have an internal WPS portal with a discussion board, calendar of upcoming WPS related events, education and training materials, and relevant WPS policy and guidance. This is really the DOD hub for all things WPS and one of our efforts to increase awareness. The Department of Defense has a global presence with personnel located around the world. This presence provides us with an unparalleled opportunity to convey WPS principles and the positive impact of women's participation in peace processes and decision making to other countries and their militaries. DOD helps partner nation militaries prepare and deploy to UN and regional peace operations through what is known as the Global Peace Operations Initiative, or GPOI. GPOI is a US government security assistance program funded through the Department of, State, Department of State and implemented primarily through the Department of Defense. One of GPOI's requirements and objectives is to promote the role of women and enhance gender integration in peace operations. Beginning in 2013, U.S. Southern Command's GPOI program partnered with the Naval Postgraduate School and the Chilean Peace Operations Training Center to build Chilean capacity to provide training and operational tools to peacekeepers on women, peace, and security issues, including the protection and integration of women in peace operations. As a result of this three-phase program, mobile training teams are deploying mobile training teams are providing the WPS program of instruction to deploying contingents in the region without support, thereby institutionalizing learning and change. And let's see if I can actually use a laser pointer. Ah, oh, I have to hold it out. So in, um, in this picture, I was actually lucky enough to be part of the training for this third phase, and it was quite incredible. And, and here you'll see the um, US team um, and also the Uruguayan um, director of the uh, National Peace Operations Training Center, ANOPU, there. And we, uh, the US team, watched the mobile training team, um, having built their capacity through Chile, um, provide the WPS course of instruction over five days to deploying peacekeepers. I believe it was 53 individuals, um, about equal men and women, which was incredible. And here you will actually see, I don't know if, uh, if there's anyone, we had to, had to crop this, but um, you actually can see in the larger photo, uh, Chileans walking around and working with these breakout groups on um, scenario-based exercises, and the exercise here was uh, 
um, how to integrate a gender perspective when you encounter a, a particular situation at a um, checkpoint. And uh, everyone is quite engaged. And we used a lot of this scenario-based training throughout the event. Well, actually, the mobile training team did. Since 2012, U.S. PACOM's GPOI capstone training exercise has included a focus on WPS. The 2015 exercise, the largest ever, involved more than 900 participants from 29 countries. And the exercise broke up these 900 participants into 10 platoons and had women serving in seven of the 10 platoons for purposes of this training exercise. Now, platoons were tasked to perform a series of missions in various peacekeeping scenarios. Platoons with women incorporated into their ranks experienced distinct advantages. In some scenarios, female role players were unable to interact with male soldiers because of preference or culture. In other situations, women soldiers were able to ease difficult situations by establishing relationships with female role players who were then able to settle more aggressive male role players. As former Assistant Secretary of State Talwar stated during the opening ceremony of the exercise, female peacekeepers broaden the tools available within a mission, particularly by improving access and support for women in societies struggling to rebuild. Programs at our combatant commands and regional centers also serve to advance the integration of women and their perspectives into the security sector. This is one of my favorite stories. As part of APCSS's in-residence curriculum, fellows are required to complete what is known as a fellows project, intended to improve some aspect of their, of their country's security sector. In fiscal year 2015, one fellow, and this is just one example, developed a project titled Breaking the Silence, Bringing Real Peace to Nepal Through Re Reconciling the Issue of Wartime Violence Against Women. Upon returning to Nepal, the fellow launched a television program to raise awareness about women and children's vulnerabil vulnerabilities during crises, including sexual and gender-based violence. The fellow has since, in a few short months, developed over 13 television episodes in Nepal, including an episode that featured an interview with Nepal's Minister of Women, Children, and Social Welfare, getting senior leader support. And in addition to pr producing the television program, the fellow is serving as an instructor, training government officials and police officers on the implementation of, of UN Security Council Resolution 1325, and other gender-specific topics. Clearly, we are building capacity and affecting change. The department recognizes that sexual and gender-based violence can significantly exacerbate situations of armed conflict and impede the restoration of peace and security. Through training, education, and awareness efforts, we are working to increase the capacity of partner nation militaries and security personnel to prevent and respond to these crimes. Hold off on that. <laughs> the Defense Institute for uh, Medical Operations, or DEMO, provides healthcare education and training to partner nations around the world. For the first time in 2015, DEMO provided in-country training on gender-based violence. The five-day course provided in Mauritius and South Africa to a total of more than 115 participants aimed to empower senior leaders and decision makers to establish effective evidence-based programs to combat gender-based violence. The course used, we see a theme, case-based examples of successful intervention in gender-based violence to show how successes can lead to clear-cut societal improvements in women's health, rule of law, stability, security, and progress of a society. Led by the US Navy, Pacific Partnership is the largest annual multilateral humanitarian assistance and disaster relief preparedness mission conducted in the Indo-Asia Pacific. I should also point out that among the many duties that reside in my office, 
humanitarian assistance and response operations, uh, the policy piece of it, sits there as well. So this is something that is critically important to us. Um, in 2015, Pacific Partnership placed a significant focus on women, peace, and security activities, including WPS exchanges with host nations. For example, Pacific Partnership included a three-day international exchange for victim advocacy workshop aimed at improving networking between stakeholders and assisting in the refinement of coordinated, effective, and victim-centered pathways for responding to sexual and gender-based violence. Interestingly, the workshop included 49 participants from four nations, most of whom were men, including representatives from government, civil society, medical, and religious sectors. Sounds like that engagement brought together so many of the topics that we have been discussing over the past two days. Rick Sinop's smiling right now, I bet. The department also advances account effective accountability mechanisms designed to address violence against women and girls, including through mobile legal seminars conducted by the Defense Institute of International Legal Studies, known as DILS, located literally across the base. Since 2008, DILS has conducted military justice engagements with the FARC. In fiscal years 14 and 15 alone, DILS conducted over 17 mobile education programs in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, with more than 4,500 soldiers and magistrates of the FARC. Each program included material on sexual and gender-based violence, included re including references to the relevant provisions of the Congolese Penal Code, the context in which acts of sexual and gender-based violence occur, and the responsibility of soldiers to report and assist authorities in apprehending and prosecuting those responsible for violations. While we have accomplished a great deal, we continue to face the challenge of implementing the NAP in a meaningful and sustainable way, as does everyone. We must not look to WPS as a standalone issue. If we see WPS as, a se as separate within the Department of Defense from other lines of effort, this initiative may continue to remain sidelined, continue to remain sidelined. Along those lines, we must continue to work to integrate WPS within existing DOD activities. Not only will this prove useful in our current resource-constrained environment, but it will also serve to reinforce that WPS is as important as our other programs. And perhaps most importantly, we must work to demonstrate through research, monitoring, and evaluation the ways in which NAP implementation directly contributes to a measurable increase in security and the success of military operations. I believe after, I don't know how many years working on this initiative, that this is the key to successfully implementing, fully implementing the National Action Plan within the Department of Defense. Thank you, Mary, for this opportunity, and um, I will look to Mary to see whether or not we have time for questions.